Welcome back to the 292nd episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, two of which are talking about the change in a cultural mentality, one about birth rates and actually having children, the second about privacy under Google. Uh, They're actually big shifts, in my opinion, about the way we view things within this country, especially culturally. And then, of course, we're going to participate in the Veep Stakes, but this time for Kamala Harris, we're going to talk about Andy Bashir and one of his news clips that I have an article on. And of course, we will end today with this daily delight. A story meant to leave you feeling positive, ready to take on the day. Now, that's enough rambling from me. Let's jump in to our daily debate. So, immigration is really at the top of the ticket this coming election. And the Democrats have been continually making an argument, which is, we need the labor. And the other people are arguing we need to increase our population in order to help us keep growing. And some people don't necessarily like that argument. Why should it go to non-Americans? Why do we have to keep growing our population? Or at least why can't we do that internally? And there's always the conversation about the fact that the natural born U.S. citizen rate is dropping. We're having less and less kids. We're below replacement rate. Well, we have an article that actually delves into the mindset of a lot of different people on this coming from the Wall Street Journal today. I want to know your opinion before you hear what they have to say. And let's be clear, none of them are on the side of having more kids. It's actually basically an explainer. It's, it's saying this is why it's okay not to have kids. That's what I took away from the article, at least. And this is a huge cultural shift. It's no longer, hey, this is a problem. Actually, you know what? I'm going to save that. Let me read the headline, then I can give my analysis about what's going on here. Here with the Wall Street Journal. So headline reads, quote, why Americans aren't having babies. And I feel as though previously the conversation has always been, oh yeah, okay, birth rates are going down. This is not necessarily a good thing. And we always tacitly say that, you know, we do not want to see our population decrease. We want to see people have more babies. We want to make sure that we are growing the population. And there's, of course, people on the side of the environmental movement who are like, no, we don't want to actually see this. We're going to be overpopulated. The Malthusian trap that has been continually pushed and pushed and pushed upon every single generation ever since it was first proposed, if not before then, it's this idea that we have finite resources here on this planet, which is most definitely true. And it's always that the human population will outstrip those resources. This time, it's the existential dread, which in the previous example, the Malthusian trap, was the outstripping of resources. This time, it's the existential dread of actually increasing the rate of climate change or even bringing children into a world that will not be prepared for them and actually will be worse off for them because of climate change. So I have uh, a few different points that I want to address, at least on the climate one, for sure. There's no doubt about that. But the other one about the Malthusian trap, how many times have we proven this wrong? It was said that the grain production would not be enough to hold the world's population going into the 1900s then guess what? We had a way to actually extract nitrogen from the air and infuse it into fertilizer, which then allowed us to be much more productive with the farmland that we had. So we see these sort of innovations that actually change the standards because the Malthusian equation is always based on what we have now, projections of the future in the population sense, but not necessarily in the innovation sense because you could even account for all the land. If you're saying there's not going to be enough arable farmland in the world in order to support this population, you have the idea or at least some semblance of what the population growth has been in the past and you can extrapolate into the future. Fair enough. So that is something that you can actually predict uh, kind of well, even though it's a little bit more exponential than just straight line uh, math. But that's something that we can at least say, okay, you can give a prediction here. And you could even say that let's give every single piece of arable land. We eventually are all living on stilts and every single cubic acre of land that is actually able to produce crops is producing crops. You could technically make that calculation. The thing that never gets included in this calculation in this formula is the fact that there is innovation because we don't know in 20 years if we'll have a new fertilizer that allows us to use that same cubic acre that would have been producing 100 grains 100 bushels of grain now could actually produce 150 grains uh, bushels of grain in the future and that changes the math equation so it takes everything at a constant meaning that all things hold equal essentially or at least the change in the human growth rate 
holds the same because you would argue, well, that's not the same human population when you're trying to actually figure out whether or not you'll be able to sustain a population on the resources that you have. Just like how we've been able to make more than just lithium batteries, but now we're starting to make cobalt batteries. As we learn more, as we test more, as we actually use up more of these resources, we force ourselves into a situation where we have to adapt. Now, the question of whether you want to force yourself into adapting, uh, yeah, maybe maybe you don't. But do you want to stagnate? Do you want to completely stop? No, and that is what is happening here when we decide not to continue having children. When we just say that, no, the future is so abysmal, and this is not everybody in this article, but there are definitely a few people in this article, and it is a widespread, even I, even I at one point in my life had said that I don't want to bring a child into this world with the economic, the economic actually, because I was at that point, I was not loving the Fed and the economic system within the United States, but also with the ecological damage that we are doing and how crazy this world is. I don't want to bring a kid into that. Even I fell for that. And the question is, do we want to stay exactly where we are? Do we want to not improve? Obviously, we're not going to be the only place having kids. There are going to be lots of kids coming from around the world. So for me to sit here and say, oh, well, if we stop having kids, it's the end of the human race. No, but if everybody took up that mentality, if everybody took up the mentality of we're not going to have kids, how could you ever improve the situation for those kids? So do you understand what I mean by that? Which is... You say, oh, the situation is terrible. We don't want to have kids because we don't want to force them into it. But you're also not giving birth to the generation, to the people who have access to more information now than ever before, who are continually getting smarter because of the internet, because of our advanced knowledge in all these different areas, who would actually be able to innovate as we have more years upon years of research. Because guess what? If you're 40 right now, which is a good chunk of a lot of these people, and you're saying, well, yeah, I'm not even going to try to have kids anymore. By the time you're 80, that's 40 years of research. Say you pass away then. That's not that much. That, that's not that much to really understand the advanced climate that we have. We've been trying it for almost 80 plus years, and we have some insights, but not the most. And to cut it off there and say, well, you know, I'm not even going to bring a child into this world who could extend that timeline another 20, 40 years that they could actually find a solution or an innovation or a way to at least cope with these sort of situations. You are pretending as though, one, you know the conclusion, but two, that all things are holding constant. And that is not how we should look at existence. We should look at existence as prospering, moving forward, and getting better, and striving to be the best. We will never be the best. We are inherently flawed we cannot be perfect because we are not from a perfect world at least in my opinion but but that doesn't mean we can't keep striving to make it better i don't think we'll ever reach utopia but we can always keep aiming for it because otherwise if you don't believe in a, a higher power spiritually then what are you aiming for within this life to be contented to be happy that's fair enough even some people in this article actually have that perspective well it having a child would get in the way of my career prospects. Or we have more time to think about ourselves when the couple sit down for an interview. And these are all great points. It begs the question, though, what is your meaning? Is your meaning to just exist, to just drift along? Do you pro want to make sure that the human race prospers? Even if you don't believe in a god, you could still have that argument, and it would be pretty noble, in my opinion. So this is maybe a deeper question about a sense of meaning that we are lacking here in the United States or, you know, in the West in general, because guess what? The West is also having this crisis. They actually had it before us. And I've had this conversation many times with my a family member of mine who is very passionate that we need to really look at the resources that we're expending and that we need to be careful with the resources that we have. And I keep saying to her, I understand where you're coming from, but remember we're going to see a decline in birth rates, and it's not just here in the United States. As every single country becomes more uh, economically powerful, as there is more economic opportunity for women, as women become more educated, we see declining birth rates. And guess what? That's fine if it's declining birth rates in one part of the world and increasing in the other. Maybe they'll level themselves out. But if everybody gets to the point where we're all saying, hey, we're contented, we want to worry about ourselves, we don't want to worry about the next generation, we don't want to worry about our kids, we don't want to provide life in this world, we don't want to have a semblance of happiness derived from something that is not our own personal 
happiness, but maybe the the sacrifice, the love that you feel for your child. Then again, you could feel that for another person, so that's fair enough. But all of these different things are, are serious questions that we need to address because if we keep going on this path and everybody gets to the point where they're si- saying, eh, no, 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 we're not going to have kids, or at least we're not going to have kids at replacement rate, then we will start seeing the decline of the population. And sometimes that's great. Sometimes that actually empowers the people in the lowest parts of the economy just like after the plague happened in england and well it happened in the middle east as well and but it found its way over to england and europe and it actually kind of created in the grounds for which feudalism fell upon because the people at the bottom part of the economy actually had more power when they went to go say hey i'll do this work for you but you don't have as many people as you used to. You couldn't just go out to the time, the square in the town and say, hey, hey anybody want to do this work? And somebody who is less well off than me would come up and say, yeah, my, my labor is worth only $5 per hour versus mine that I'm valuing at eight and therefore undercut you. Now that the population was shrinking and there were less, basically, there was less supply of workers, the power of those individuals went up in the marketplace and it kind of led to the destruction of feudalism. So you could make an argument that it's actually a good thing. It's kind of a cycle. It's going to create a mass middle and lower class uh, rising in the economic stratum. But I don't know if that's too far off to be looking that way personally, but also I think we need to address it right here and right now. Do we want to come to a place where we have to be looking for the benefits in the mass death of large segments of populations? No, not personally. So let's jump into one of the first quotes from one of the actual people that they interviewed quote to be a human being for most people meant to have a child says Anastasia Berg, co-author with Rachel Wiseman of a new book, What Are Children For? on ambivalence and choice. Quote, you don't, didn't think about how much it would cost. It ha- was taken for granted, she says. And this is another great point. And honestly, I have not read this book. I kind of want to go out and buy it. I'm not going to lie to you because she brings up a really great point. Beyond just the existential dread factors, there are increasing amounts of cost to raising children. Now, there have been interesting counter arguments here, which is the maybe the fundamental costs have gone up, but they're stayed relatively even with inflation. This is an argument from a few different people who actually are for more higher birth rates and having more children. And they would argue that the other increase in cost is just people raising the standards of what they need to provide their children, which, you know, as we develop as an economy, as there's more money be thrown around and you go up the economic stratum a little bit, you kind of go up that ladder. Sure. Yeah. You're going to be willing to throw around a little bit more money to make sure your children succeed, but then it actually increases the amount of demand for it, therefore increasing the price of some of these things as well. So it's a very interesting way to break it down. But I do want to tell one personal story from here because I found it, how do I, I don't want to be, I, if I found it very, very interesting. So here is one of the quotes from one of the couples that sat down, and they're from Louisiana. Uh, Quote, Beth Davis loves her niece and nephew. This is the beginning of it, and we're going to skip on down to the quote. Quote, people told me when I was younger, oh, you'll grow into it. You'll develop those feelings. You'll want to start a family. And that just didn't happen, says Enfield, a creative director. This is the gentleman. They moved to New Orleans a year ago in search of the city's Juve de Vir uh, and other childless millennials. The, with a combined income of 280000 the couple is able to put about 4500 a month towards what they hope will be a mid-50s retirement. Another 2600 pays rent on a sprawling Creole townhouse. The remaining 8000 or so, much of which they assume would have been eaten up by children rearing, goes primarily toward their lives. And it's a very... How should I say? It's a very me, me, me centric way of looking at it. Um, And they even say that, which is we want to focus on ourselves. We want to be able to give more love to each other. And that's honorable. That really is. And if you can be contented and happy with each other, great. But I I don't know if this is a long-term path towards a happy nation 
one that is so focused on its current existence, on its own prospering, and not looking towards the future. Because not only is that not good culturally in general, in my opinion, I'll give you specifics. If you're a nation that's worried about your own survival in the now and you're not worried about the future, are you building companies that you're building companies that will succeed now and give you your paycheck until you're gone? Are you building companies that you can pass off to your children? Are you building economic structures that will actually benefit your children, your grandchildren? Basically, children, grandchildren, these ties that bind us to the nation, because guess what? Are you going to leave if you genuinely care about your child? Are you going to leave the house that you have in the worst po position possible? Or are you going to leave it with a uh, hundred thousand dollars of credit line of credit taken out on the mortgage so basically when you sell when their child your so child sells it because you pass away they get nothing of it you're going to try to be as responsible as possible obviously people are put in hard situations but if you can you're probably not going to do that because you want your children to be better off than you were you want them to be able to succeed and being invested in the future of this nation it comes with it can happen without. If you love the ideals of this country, you can be invested in this country without children. I can tell you now, children are an easier mechanism to get there. Because, like I said, if you want your child to actually have a stable home, you're going to be out there either working your butt off to prepare them to change their home and make it stable or you're going to be out there working your butt off to keep it a stable place so that they can grow up happy healthy, and maybe even be better off than you. And I think this speaks to a really dangerous cultural shift, which is no longer is it just, like I said at the very beginning of this, no longer is it just, oh, well, some people aren't having kids. That's not really okay. Like We always question them, why haven't you had kids? There's kind of an underlying social question there, which, fair enough, some people get really tired of, I understand, um, and you have to, you know, pass it off, and I think we should have a social standard of some degree to have kids if you're fully capable of having them, uh, then the other question, it's, it's shifted from that, which is, oh, why don't you have kids, the standard is to have kids, to giving people a free pass to not have kids, and honestly, I'll be 100% I'll be frank, if 25% of the population could not have kids, and then 75% of the, like the 25% of the population that genuinely feel like they're not cut out to have kids, and they don't want to have kids, great, but the other 75% could make up for it, that'd be 100%. As long as we're above replacement rate as a whole, as a nation, sounds good to me. I would love to be well above it, but at least we have to start there. But the fact is that the other 75% is still having at replacement rate or even maybe less than that. I mean, I'm an only child. I, my, I am a great example of this. I, my parents, there were two of them. I, that's how making a baby works. So if, if you didn't know at this point, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that you're just learning now, but it takes two people. And I'm just one. Guess what? That means that they did not replace the amount of bodies that they will be taking from this earth when they pass away. God forbid, please make it a long, 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 long time from now. But the point being, if we keep having situations like that where we have only children, and trust me, I asked, I begged, I begged for other siblings when I was younger, um, then we're going to have a place where we could have to come to a place where we're either importing all the people to ensure our growth economically, even though there are other ways to do it, the most basic way is to bring in more productive labor and increase productivity. The uh, ways of increasing productivity are harder, but at least bringing in the labor to actually uh, fulfill the jobs is one way to do it. And if we don't keep doing that, which some people want to shut that down, they, I mean, we have a very, very, how should I say, it's a very clear, very, very clear path forward when talking about the message from the right, which is shutting down the borders. And that's great. Shut down the borders if you think that's way to so solve X, Y, Z problem. I don't, I'm not going to make a policy prescription on this one, but you're saying shut down the borders and you're saying, well, we're bringing in too many people from outside countries and then trying to make the argument that we need to have more people within this country. And yes, I understand where you're coming from, natural born American citizens. Great. How about we get to the place where we actually can have enough natural born American citizens and then do that? Then again, the counter argument, which I think is a very valid counter argument, I actually kind of subscribe to this one myself, would be something to the effect of, well, if you 
don't if you don't if you continue to enable the behavior if you continue to bring people in until people actually get to replacement rate because they realize okay this is something we want to do in the future and we don't want to see the birth rate of our nation decline and therefore the economic power of our nation decline so heavily then you have to actually kind of bring them to an abrupt moment because it has to be not necessarily a crisis but it at least has to be something at the forefront of people's minds and it's not that when you keep giving them a pass by bringing in other labor and i think that's actually a very strong counter argument obviously because i subscribe to it myself all right so with that other way we just went through that article from the wall street journal we also have another one which is a little bit shorter and this one comes from them with the headline google is keeping cookies in chrome after all so if you remember in 2022 they announced that they're working on a big project in order to uh, limit the cookies that websites would be able to keep when going through google services and some people said this is great look at this more privacy yes no you can't just keep tracking my information and then all the other advertisers and people that were more aware with the ad space said, okay, yeah, I understand that sounds good, but how are we going to get all this information about the users and so on and so forth? And then Google basically said, well, through our ad software, since they're opting into using our search engine, we could still have some sort of data analytics and make sure your ads get to the right people. So the argument was from the ad buyers, so basically you're strengthening your own position in the marketplace and demanding that we use your tools in order to actually sell our ads rather than using third-party tools that wouldn't necessarily be able to access the same information that your tools would be able to. And Google Google, after about two years now, said, um, yeah, we're kind of pulling back. Yeah, there's been a bit of a, a revolution, a little bit of a revolt. So let me go back here uh, and read one of the first few sentences. Quote, Google first announced its intention to kill cookies, the technology that logs the activity of Internet users across the websites at, so advertisers can target them with relevant ads and track their effectiveness in 2020. It said it would phase them out by 2022. So that's when they were supposed to start doing it. The plan had been issued at this point. They were actually coming to fruition on how to do it. But then they hit a little bit of a snag. Quote, in April, the Wall Street Journal reported that the British government's information commissioner office took issue, would issue a report criticizing Google's proposed replacement technology as deeply flawed. A few days later, Google said it would delay cookies exp expiration beyond last announced La the last announced target date of the end of this year. So why is this important? You're, Ale I, you, you're asking yourself, Alex, you said at the beginning this is culturally important because this is crucially culturally important. Not many people realize the amount of private data that we give up. And even if they do acknowledge it, they, they kind of hand wave. Oh, yeah, Google's taking my information here. They're selling my information here. Oh, yeah, I said something the other day, and it popped up in my, my Amazon feed. Oh, it's just Google doing Google. They're just messing around. You know how Google is. And this move, which really went underneath the radar, was an actual move ahead. There was some, obviously some people out there advocating for it for a long time, but the mass public really didn't care. They were not aware of this. And this was Google jumping ahead and saying, hey, this is something of the future that we want to care about. And also, it was a shrewd business plan on their part because it would make people more reliant on their services. And then the advertisers, the people, and it's very interesting here, remember, advertisers and the firms that actually sell these ads through Google, use the Google tools and third-party tools, all of these are actually built on top of the infrastructure that Google created. And, well, I say that. Google, DARPANET, all these very beginning browsers created, which is free but AdSense. So Google actually created this own system in order to benefit so that you could go on there for free and then they could still make money off of it. And now there are so many people financially dependent on it that they can't even change it for the betterment of the people who the service is meant for. They can't even do it to protect our data as customers. This is huge. This really does show that we as customers have to revolt just as loud, just as violently as the people who are on the ad, ad agency side. And I advise you, I beg you, download something like 
a DuckDuckGo for as an extension for your Chrome. Download something like a Brave. Make sure you double check the vetting. You vet all of these. Um, you may think, oh, Opera. Opera is technically owned by a Chinese company now, so they could actually take your data into China. Technically, they say they don't, but technically they could because every company that wor operates within China has to comply with the CCP. So there are a whole bunch of these other options out there that don't just send your data off to third parties or at least you can make them you can say okay yeah you can send them to certain people and then you can turn them off completely and you can say no you can't you can't send it anyway or even brave brave says actually we'll pay you uh, we'll give you like little bits of cryptocurrency i stopped actually checking that my wallet there a long time ago i probably could should keep doing it because Honestly, I use that thing all the time now, and I would probably have a few little tokens that are saved up there. But then you can actually pay those companies in those tokens as well. So you get paid for your advertising dollars, and then you can just give it right back if you don't actually care about it and you don't want to redeem it. So these sort of options are out there, and we as consumers have to say to Google, if you won't do it yourselves, we've had a little bit of hope. We believed in the better angels. You proved us wrong. Now we're coming for you. Because at the end of the day, government coming in and saying we have a digital bill of rights, while I think it's an interesting solution, while I did an episode on it quite some time ago, how there are certain, at, there are certain rights that we need to ensure that are in place when going into this new VR, AR world, um, we need to realize it's the government. The government's not going to be able to do everything, and we as consumers have to speak because guess what? It's the money that's talking right now that's keeping Google from doing this, so we have to show them there's a little bit something else going on on our end. There's a little bit more oomph in our buyer power and not use them. Now, am I saying that's actually going to happen? Am I saying this podcast is going to deeply change that? No, because also this is posted on YouTube, which is owned by Google. So I understand there is a long way to go, but if you want to be a part of it, if you want to start the process, if you want to create the financial incentives outside of Google, maybe you should consider going and downloading some of these other places. Stop using Google for all the traffic that you can. I understand there are some things that just don't show up unless they're on Google. But for the most part, you can find almost any information you need if you want to put in like an extra five seconds. I know it's not convenient, but if you really care about this and you want to show Google, hey, you are not just the only girlfriend in my life. You know, I, we're, we're see, I'm seeing some other people. Okay, you don't have all that control over me. You know, give me a little bit of space and uh, respect me a little bit more. Then. There you go. And I don't think that's actually a way to go about dating. Please do not do that. Respect anybody that you're intimately involved with. But, okay, that's enough on that one. Remember, we are the power that we want to see in the free market. Restrain your dollars. Keep them from going to those places. Even get ad blockers or get pop-up blockers or get cookie blockers. Uh, technically, cookie blockers are harder to do. Read every single f cookie setting and try to get turn them off so people can't just mine your data and they can only use functional cookies which even then are still mining your data to some degree but you know at least limit what they can get from you and show them that hey we care and we're not just going to fall for the defaults that they set for us so this is our last article that comes from let me see here the daily beast the headline reads andy Bashir and roy cooper audition live to be harris vp and i'll be honest I saw this video, and I kind of giggled. I'm not going to lie. So Andy Bashir, for those of you who don't know, he's the governor of Kentucky. He's about 46 year old. He is a blue governor in a state that voted red for Donald Trump, who had a supermajority of Republicans in the House and Senate. And basically, he tried to veto things, and they just kept overpowering him. So anything that actually happened during his first term, not anything. There are some things where he did approve it, but there's like two, two bills, I believe, two, three bills. Uh, I need to go back and double check that. It was, it's been a while since I actually looked at the bills that he passed. But the point being, a lot of them just skipped right over him because of the overpowering of the veto by the supermajority in the Kentucky uh, House and Senate. And guess what? He's going to take claim for it. He's going to say, oh, I did all these things. But all of them, most of them that couldn't be done through executive order just went straight over him through the legislator operating in Kentucky. So don't believe that one. I lived in Kentucky. I was a part of, I was in the, the circles that were running around. I literally lived in the Capitol. Now, did I go over there and petition any people? No, no, I, I wasn't on there on the ground wearing a suit every day. But I can tell you now, anyone that knows anything about Kentucky is the fact that 
Bashir's legacy is basically built off of his father's name. And while he could use this as a stepping stool into the broader politics of the United States, I have a hard time believing that this is something that he'll actually be able to pull off. Um, so with that, let's jump into our daily delight. This video comes from, I believe it's Boing Boing, but no, it's Woo Global. And the headline reads, Adorable Dogs Confuse TV Pups for Real Dogs, leading to a hilarious moment. So obviously, barking on the TV, and it's a connected wall, so there's actually, you can go through the doorway, and they sprint behind the door, they sprint through the door to the other side of the wall, and they see there's no dogs. And then they come back to the TV, they're like, oh my gosh, there's more, there's another dog now. It's a, it's actually just hilarious. You've probably seen this before if you have a dog, but I just always enjoy these sort of things, and maybe you can get a nice little giggle out of it so you leave today uh, feeling a little bit more happy, a little bit more energetic. So thank you for joining me for this episode of the Daily Flip podcast. If you want to check out, out the podcast on Spotify, Pocket Cast, or Podvine, the links are in the description below. Also down there, you can find the link to the pod, uh, to the Twitter tirade that comes out at the Twitter handle, at your Daily Flip, every Tuesday and Thursday. Less scripted, just kind of off the top of my head, randomly yelling, basically, not yelling, but ye old man yelling at the sky thinking about things, basically. Uh, also, if you did get this far... I probably should have made a disclaimer at the very beginning. I am in a completely different location, which means the audio settings are different, and I'm going to try to fiddle with them and actually make a new preset that fixes some of the humdrum from the air conditioner that's right behind me. Uh, but I'm sorry if it doesn't sound up to its normal quality. So with all that said, there's only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.